Hi, and thank you for having me here. Um, I know this is being videotaped, so I'm, I'm told that I have to stay right here. So I won't be um, moving around, but I do have a pointer just to show you some of the interesting slides that I have. So aortic stenosis um, is a disease um, that we deal with all the time with a lot of our patients. But just going back to the basics, there are four valves in the heart, um, the mitral, tricuspid, aortic, and pulmonic valves. And the aortic valve is located between the left ventricle here and the aorta. And here, this is the valve that uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about today. And as you know, valves maintain a one-way blood flow through the heart. So just going back, when um, you look at the aortic valve, there are four different types that um, can possibly happen to a person. The most common one is the tricuspid valve. This is just a cartoon depiction of it, and this is the normal aortic valve. However, patients can be born um, with a Cuspid. This is, these are cross sections of unicuspid valves, a bicuspid valve, and this is um, a cross section of it um, in, actually in surgery. And then the other one is very, very rare, um, a quadricuspid. And it's, there are four valves um, with that. And of those four valves, there are different variations. I just put this up, it's kind of hard to see, but some of the valves can be bigger than the others. Three can be larger, one could be smaller, two could be equal in size and two, uh, the other two smaller. So there are, they classify them from A to G. Um, congenital heart defects are believed to occur in utero during the early weeks of pregnancy. When the baby's heart develops, there may be a genetic link um, either occurring to, um, from a genetic a gene defect, a chromosome, abnormality or environmental exposure. Um, congenital bicuspid valves are the most common and those usually occur later in life, fourth, fifth, and sixth decade. Um, and they believe if calcium deposits around the leaflets eventually cause the valve to stiffen and narrow. The other um, there, you know, when you talk about aortic valve disease, we talk about acquired aortic valve disease. And those are things that you pick up along the way, um, either through uh, exposure to things, such as rheumatic heart disease. You, um, when kids sometimes get a uh, strep throat, um, they can get an infection. And if it's not treated appropriately, the valve itself um, can stiffen and harden, and this is from the antibodies developed by the body to fight the infection. Endocarditis is a bacterial infection, as we know, that can also cause um, the valve to get hardened. Um, the one that we're specifically going to hone in on is degenerative calcific aortic stenosis, which we deal with with our TAVR patient population. Um, and the aortic valve leaflets degenerate and become calcified over time. And this generally happens in the seventh, eighth, and ninth decade of life. Other causes are rheumat rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory diseases, lupus, syphilis, um, less common tumors, some types of drugs, and radiation for cancers. Aortic stenosis is predominantly a degen degenerative disease. As you can see the slide here, um, AS, <clears throat> aortic stenosis, aortic regurge, um, the dark, the navy color, are, um, most of those patients, it's all due to degener degeneration of the valve. So like I said before, we're focusing on the degenerative calcific aortic stenosis, um, and it is similar to atherosclerosis, um, mainly solid calcium deposits within the valve. Here you can see a normal aortic valve open and closed, and again, we're talking mostly about the tricuspid valve here. Um, and here with stenosis, when it's open, it's not completely open. So you can imagine if the blood has to get out of the left ventricle to get to the aorta to give blood to the brain and body, it's pushing up against the stenotic valve. So it puts a lot of compromise on the heart. Um, and this is when it's closed. You can see the leaflets are not collapsing nicely against each other. Um, so you can get a little bit of regurgitation or backflow. Similar risk factors um, for patients that develop this are similar to uh, CAD. 
America's increasing age, male gender, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension, and there's a high coincidence of CAD and AS in the same individual. And this is, um, these are just um, s screenshots I put here. This is a normal um, tri leaflet aortic valve. You can see there's some transparency here and how nice it looks. It collapses nicely. Um, the leaflets close together nicely. Here um, is a valve that has calcium deposits on it. And over time, look at all these chunks of calcium. And you can see that it's not closed um, 100%. So you can get, again, a leakage there. The key facts about aortic stenosis in developed countries, it's the most prevalent of all valvular heart disease, and AS is increasing as our average age of our population increases. Um, you know, severe aortic stenosis due to this is fatal if not treated. So years ago, patients would come in, and if they were too high risk or inoperable with aortic stenosis, Basically, they would keep coming back in with heart failure and worsening symptoms because we couldn't take them to the OR. The surgeons deemed them too high risk or inoperable. And they really did have a horrible demise. Um, so the emergence of transcatheter therapies offers promise for treating patients with severe AS who are considered for, um, that have intermediate or extreme surgical risk. Classic symptoms of aortic stenosis, obviously heart failure is a big one there. Um, angina, syncope, fatigue, and palpitations, those are the most um, symptoms that we do see when patients do come in. Um, they'll complain of a few of those, all of them, or even just fatigue or I'm not feeling well. Heart failure, the pathophysiology that creates heart failure is an increasing pressure gradient across the aortic valve. Um, here from the left ventricle, going to the aorta to get to the body, and that leads to concentric LVH. Angina and syncope, it's hypoperfusion, so you're not getting the blood to the coronary arteries and the brain. So, um, you know, patients just can feel it in those symptoms. With syncope, that usually does occur during exercise that they feel, all of a sudden they'll go down. Instead of severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, once symptoms occur, you can see here we're talking about, um, you know, it, this is uh, in years, the age, 65, um, survival percent. Once a patient starts to get um, symptoms, the onset, 50% of them die within two years if they don't get treatment. And here you can see that um, heart failure is the worst. Angina, you have a little bit more time, syncope in between those two. But once you start to develop heart failure, you have to get these patients treated right away if you can. Diagnosis, typically, we as medical providers hear a murmur. Um, and then based on that, we either have the patient sent for an echo can, you, you're looking at the valves, you're getting measurements, you're seeing what the patient has, what the murmur is due to. On chest x-ray, you can sometimes see an enlarged heart, you can actually sometimes see calcified aortic valve in rare instances. EKG, not really definitive, but you can see LVH, some ST changes that lead you to say, what's going on, let me pursue this. And obviously our cardiac cath, another measure that we use to look at the valve area, pressure gradients, and to look at the coronary arteries, because if we were to go ahead and fix someone's aortic valve, we want to make sure we know what's going on with the rest of the heart. If they do have coronary artery disease, we have to figure out, are we sending this patient off for SAVR cabbage, or are we treating, doing a PCI, and then a subsequent TAVR? The ECHO is the gold standard um, in assessing severe aortic stenosis. So when you look at this grid here, it's broken down. The indicator is mild, moderate, or severe. Um, for aortic stenosis, we are specifically looking at the valve area. The valve area, anything less than or equal to one um, is severe. And a mean gradient greater than 40 is severe or 
a jet velocity greater than four. And then you just, when you look at these, you think of these terms, jet velocity is how fast something goes through. So if you have an obstruction, it's not gonna go so fast. So it's gonna take more time. So it's meters per second. Um, if you think of a king toes, if it's, oh, if it's not kinked, it's gonna go really fast. The water's gonna go right through it very fast. But if it is kinked, it's gonna slow down over time. So your jet velocity is gonna increase. And the same with the mean gradient, you're taking the pressure, the reading of the left ventricle and the aorta, and it's a, a measurement between the two. And it gives you a reading of how much of a gradient there is across that valve. And valve areas, obviously, as you know, it gets smaller. This is just a depiction of a, um, the valve, normal, all, t all the way to severe, and with a hose, and you put a nozzle on it. As the nozzle gets smaller, um, same as the valve, just a cartoon image for, your, for those visual learners. Under treatment, uh, there was a lot of discussion years ago and a lot of studies about patients that have severe aortic stenosis and not getting treatment. Um, in blue, it's those patients, none of them had an AVR. And we're talking surgical aortic valve replacement for this, um, looking at this um, slide. Um, and in the green, those are the patients that had aortic valve replacement. So and what's going on with all these patients in the blue? Why were they not being treated? And they started to find out that patients who were seen by their physicians, some of them were felt to be too old. Some of them, they didn't know about, um, you know, treatments or correct treatments. So even though this was back at the time with just Saver, as Taver emerged, this was still going on where they didn't realize that there is actually something else other than surgical aortic valve replacement. The partner trial was a huge trial. Um, they noted that, uh, that in inoperable patients with severe AS uh, that did not receive a valve replacement, 50% of those died um, within a year. This was done over 40, 24 months, and the control group, um, it was medical management or balloon aortic valvuloplasty. We do do balloon aortic valvuloplasty here at the hospital, but in the cath lab we do it, but it's usually for those patients that either need a bridge to getting their valve fixed or they have um, short-term life expectancy due to either cancer or something and they're on palliative care. And it's really just to give them some relief of their symptoms. Balloon aortic valvuloplasty over time, it doesn't last long-term. We've seen patients that in two months after having it, their valve has gone back. Um, to being severe again. So after that study, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they, they compared standard therapy with TAVA patients. And this is all-cause mortality over 24 months. And TAVA showed that there was an improvement and that all-cause mortality um, was far worse with standard therapy. And then, and they compared TAVR with SAVR. And over time, their all-cause all mortality was about the same. So that was groundbreaking. Based on these studies, the FDA approved use of transcatheter aortic valve replacement for those patients who were deemed high risk. We talk about this high risk all the time. And it's, called, it's a surgical risk score that we do. The acronym is STS score. So it had to be any patient that came through our doors had to have a STS score greater than 8%. And their 30-day mortality um, for open surgical aortic valve replacement. So basically, we put in all these calculations on these patients. Um, you can go online. Anyone can do it. You can put in the patient's age, gender, their comorbidities, and it spits out the risk of mortality for 30 days, and it has to be over 8%. That was back then. Now the FDA has gotten lenient as of August of last year. We are now able to do TAVRs on those patients 
with intermediate risk, and that's greater than 3%. So it's actually opened up. You've seen a lot more healthier patients probably come to the ICU, to our valve clinic, than years ago. We used to have the sickest of the sickest. And the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they issued um, the national coverage determination on May 1st of 2012, which allows coverage for TAVR procedures in institutions. We had to fit a lot of criteria. We had to do a lot of um, procedures in the cath lab. We had to have a, a certain amount of AVRs done in our institution, which we did. We qualified for all of that. Of that. But the things that we have to always make sure that we're doing is to have two cardiac surgeons independently examine the patient face to face and evaluate the patient's suitability for open surgical aortic valve replacement. So we have Dr. Pasek, Fernandez, and Gallagher. They actually have to see the patient and say, this patient, so-and-so, is high risk because, or intermediate risk because of A, B, or C. You can even write your surgical risk score. So um, also on the, the CMS issue that all patients with aortic valve disease now have to be seen by a, a heart valve team. So we instituted that. In, we started doing that in screening patients in 2012. And that the heart team, the interventional cardiologist and cardiac surgeon must jointly participate in the intraop technical aspects of TAVR. And we also have to maintain a registry, which is a 242 um, data point uh, document that has to be filled out on every patient. So our heart valve team consists of, as you can see, surgeons, interventional cardiologists, radiologists, our physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, um, um, everyone, it includes people that um, see the patients in our valve clinic um, and the people in the hospital. So it's a huge team. Everyone, including all of you that are here today, um, are considered part of this team. When a patient does come in to be evaluated, um, they can have a myriad of uh, comorbidities. The surgical risk score I mentioned before doesn't take into account certain diseases. And those are the ones that I labeled in red, such as liver disease, hostile chest from radiation, GI dysfunction such as Crohn's disease, active malignancy, CNS dysfunction, anyone with dementia. We typically don't do anyone with moderate to severe dementia because their outcomes are very poor. Skeletal deformities such as um, scoliosis and significant kyphosis, also those patients are not included in that surgical risk score. With our team in the valve clinic, I have um, two of my coworkers actually here that are phenomenal. Kate and Wendy, they help with our patients to get them through this. We do um, do other measurements. Um, if a patient's surgical risk score doesn't meet the criteria, say they're less than 3%, and they don't have any of those other things like radiation to the chest or um, skeletal deformities, we can get a patient in to have a TAVR if they meet frailty criteria. So we do do frailty criteria measurements. We do the grip test. It's with a dynamometer. And the, if you, the patient has an impaired grip strength for females, it's less than 18 kilograms. And for men, it's uh, tw less than 22 kilograms. And they would meet frailty criteria. Another one is the five meter gait speed test. Just having someone walk three times, we do this five meter um, test in or valve clinic, and it's the average speed. It has to be greater than seven seconds. So if someone's really slow, they're considered frail. A measurement of albumin is also anything greater than less than 3.5 is considered um, frail because someone who's not eating, you know, they get deficient, so we can do their albumin if we need to. Another one is the independence of activities of daily living, the CAT score. This is just something that the patients are handed when they come to our clinic, they fill it out. And it's also, if they can't do things like toileting, um, dressing, transferring, and if they're incontinent, those, um, you can use that as a frailty measure as well. Another 
This is our other um, frailty measurement. It's called the eyeball test. It's kind of subjective, but you're looking at someone um, and you're, you're seeing if you feel that they are frail just by looking at them. But you can see these two patients, A and B, they all, both have this um, same age and same surgical risk score. But obviously one does not pass the eyeball test. Every week, our team, um, I put together this grid. We evaluate every single patient. We take a picture of a patient. Um, our physicians do like to see it. It has our echo data, cath data, cat scan data, um, carotids, uh, PFTs, the referral physicians, and the doctors that saw them in our heart valve team. And we also have, with this particular patient who's coming up for TAVR, she, her surgical risk score, when we first evaluated her, was 44. That's incredibly high. Um, she went through a lot of stuff, um, PCI, BAV, and now she's stable. She was so sick. Now she's stable, recently came to our valve clinic, and her SDS went down to 6.5%. So she is definitely on the road to getting her TAVR um, coming in. So uh, this is a weekly... Um, meeting with everyone from our radiologists, interventional cardiologists, and surgeons. We all are there to figure out what is the plan of care for this particular patient. After referral to the TAVO team, um, you know, we do start with, we have the echo, we get the cath, like I mentioned, the CAT scan. Um, the CAT scan is particularly important because it helps us to determine which size valve to put in, which access we use. Um, this is just measurements of the, the long axis of the aortic valve, and we take these measurements into account. Um, and this is the annulus of the aortic valve, which uh, we, we measure that, and that helps us to determine the area. Um, and then it gives us, it dictates the t size valve. Here is a measurement, here's the aorta, and the valve is right here. Sometimes the white stuff here, that's calcification. Sometimes it can extend down um, into the left ventricular outflow tract, and that sort of determines which valve we would use. We would probably use a core valve in that case because it's self-bolding around that chunk of calcium. If we use the sapien, sometimes you just want to make sure you're not causing, when you inflate the balloon, it pushes that calcium out, and you can get an annular rupture. This is the access we look at. We look at all the measurements. The um, TAVR valve is a 14 French. In most cases, 16 French in other sizes. So it's a little bit larger than a cardiac cath, um, catheter that we use. When we first started, it was 24 French. So was tremendous. We had a lot of vascular, not a lot, we've had some vascular issues as you may have seen, but we do take these measurements, um, very strict um, guidelines and make sure we know which side we're using, if it's torturous, if, if it's calcified. The team does determine um, the treatment for each patient, whether it's SAVR, TAVR, BAV, or even medical management in some circumstances. This was groundbreaking, also a study um, with the ACC in 2016, and it compared TAVR to SAVR, and actually um, this TAVR showed that it showed um, it was much more improved than SAVR. So this sort of changed. There's a shift in the paradigm um, that's um, switching. People are... Um, Years ago, it used to be where surgical aortic valve replacement was the gold standard. Um, it, had, it has great outcomes. Patients do really well. But now we're, you know, when you have someone and you have these studies that are showing TAVR is better and better, patients come to our clinic and they just, they want to have the less invasive approach. So it's hard to sort of figure out what is the best for each patient. If someone's 70 years old and we know that the outcomes for surgical aortic valve replacement, those, those valves last, last 10, 15 years, that durability is significant. Whereas with the TAVR, our durability, our studies are just coming out. So we only know that our valves are good up to about five, seven years, only because we haven't gone through the future yet. 
And as the latest iteration happens, you know, the studies were done on valves that we don't really use anymore because they've gotten better. Um, the evolution of the valve has, uh, we're now at the latest iteration here at Danbury Hospital with uh, those two companies that we work with. So this is just a study again of the five years of proven valve durability for the TAVR valves. Um, when our team does meet, this is a letter that's put in the chart, um, and it, it, we circle whether it's intermediate, if the patient meets intermediate risk, high risk or inoperable, and we check off what um, applies to that particular patient. We put in their surgical risk score, whether they meet frailty or major organ system compromise, the other comorbidities that I mentioned earlier, and each of the physicians sign that chart, that um, document. Access options for TAVR, we have the direct aortic, transaortic, um, transfemoral, transapical, which is going at the bottom into the left ventricle. They go through the ribs and the muscles. That tends to be a little bit more painful for patients. Subclavian, we haven't done those yet. We almost did do a patient, but we can. you can do subclavian route. Most of our patients, when we first started, were either transaortic or transapical. We do most of our patients th through the transfemoral route. Sapien 3 is the latest iteration. Um, we started off with Sapien, Sapien XT, now Sapien 3. Um, Sapien is made out of, uh, there's bovine, which is cow pericardium. And there's an inner skirt and the outer ceiling skirt to help with leakage. And it's a very low frame. And this is made out of cobalt chromium. These are the different ranges of sizes for patients. Get their area and then based on the CAT scan finding, and then we decide which size valve the patient needs. If there's any, um, sometimes our CAT scans, there can be a misalignment during the procedure. If we feel that we need to take better measurements, we will actually do a TE to verify the size. This is how it sits in the aortic valve area. The native valve is kind of pushed up, it's pushed up against the wall, and the valve is placed inside, and this is one of the coronary ostia. We also now do valve and valve procedures here that has been approved also for Sapien XT, which is an earlier model. So the FDA approved um, valve and valve procedures. So if someone had a surgical aortic valve replacement that is now failing um, for central aortic regurgitation, we can do a valve and valve pre procedure, which you've seen. Medtronic um, is the other valve that we use. There are two FDA approved valves in the country. There are a lot of trials going on, but the two FDA approved valves are the Medtronic Evolute Pro. Evolute R, we just, um, that just changed to Pro. Um, and the other one is Sapien. Um, Edwards Life Science is the second valve. So Medtronic um, is a recapturable valve. So up to 80%, you can put the valve in, you feel like you're not in the great in great position, you can recapture it and pull it back up and then reposition it. It is made out of porcine, which is pig pericardium. And this is made out of nitinol. So what they do is they actually put it in cold saline, crimp it, it's crimps, it kind of crimps down, and then when it's brought into the body by the warmth of the blood and the body, it actually opens up and self-molds um, on the annulus. So these are the different sizes um, with the Evolute, Evolute Pro, 23, 26, and 29, and the Evolute R, which is a 34 millimeter. It's not yet up to the Pro. They haven't, those studies are coming out, so hopefully we'll have the Evolute Pro. The difference between the two is that the skirt is on the outside now, which decreases um, perivabular leak. So this is just, uh, I just want to show you an Edward Sapien transcatheter. It kind of went fast. So this is under fluoro. Um, this is a TE probe. This patient had bypass before you can see. And this is the catheter coming up from the groin around the aorta through the aortic valve. Um, 
and this is the Edward Sapien valve right here. So we'll let that play. Oops. Inject a little contrast there and see the balloon right here. It's kind of hard to see, it looks like a little sausage and this is the valve deployed. And so the docs are now pulling the catheter out. We do pace the patients during this procedure. You essentially don't want any cardiac output because you don't want the valve to be ejected. And this is just a cartoon animation from Edwards also. So really calcified, barely opening. And this is the transapical approach, so through the, through the left ventricle. So they bring a wire across the valve, tiny wire, and then they bring the um, balloon up. Pa all patients, these patients have a temporary pacemaker placed prior to this procedure starting. And they inflate the balloon to just open the valve up a little bit, um, the native valve up open a little bit more. So it's easier when you bring in the new valve. And they use the balloon, they're pacing, and they use the balloon to inflate it, pushing it up against the valve. And then they take out the catheters. So you can see the old valve up against the wall. And a closer look at the deployment of the Evolute R. So you can see this is where the valve is, and it's gonna come out, it's kind of like they call it, it's flowering. flowering. So they twist the dial, they pull back part of um, the delivery system, they inject some dye, and then they feel good about where their, um, their, where their deployment is, and it sort of flowers out. Take their time with this. This one actually is a little bit slower, whereas the Edwards Life Sciences, you have to kind of go quicker because the blood pressure does drop. And see, that's 80% to the valve, and that's the annular plane. When we measure, we measure the three cusps together, they get an annular plane, and that's where they know where to deploy it. It's held on by these two rings, these, um, um, and then they feel comfortable, they pull everything out. We always do post echo images to see how much um, AI they have after the procedure. If someone has mild trace AI, that's okay. If anyone has moderate to severe AI AR after the procedure, we may consider doing post balloon dilation. So it's actually taking a balloon and putting through the valve to push the valve up again to have a snug seal because um, prognosis long term, anyone that has moderate to severe aortic regurge after TAVR has a poor prognosis. 
patient post-op care, many of the clinical management of patients, we tend to think maybe it's similar to surgery. It is in some aspects, but things that we have to pay attention to are blood pressure control, pain management, ventilator weaning and extubation, if they are intubated, uh, chest drainage, if we did do a transapical approach. Um, transaortic, we, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Um, Pasek typically did not use a chest tube. However, Dr. Um, Gallagher did uh, use one with a, one of our recent cases. Um, arrhythmias we have to pay attention to because the, the way the valves sit, um, they're very close to the conduction system. Sometimes we will see a patient having some heart block or some arrhythmia intraoperatively. We'll get EP involved, keep the temporary pacemaker in, have the evaluation, and see how the patient does on telemetry. Oral intake, making sure these patients do eat, um, getting them back to their regular routine. Antiplatelet therapy, patients are on Plavix for six months and baby aspirin uh, for life typically. If a patient's on Coumadin, it's Coumadin and aspirin. And then transferring them, getting them ICU to step down and transfer to home. I do tell these patients in pre-op, your typical length of stay is about one to three days. We like to get these patients up and moving. We talk about incentive spirometer. We talk about the things early ambulation just to move that because that's a new initiative that we have for the ICU. Um, with our post-op care, keeping the blood pressure between 100 and 130, not only just because of it's a newly placed valve, it's also for the groin management. Someone who's hypertensive, you really can't control that groin so much. Pain management, we do have patients, you know, if they, um, incision in the chest that typically are more, um, they can complain of pain. We like to keep away from narcotics because it can suppress the respiratory drive. I do talk to patients about that also in pre-op. You know, really the goal is Tylenol as needed, maybe Tylenol with codeine, but really less narcotics. Um, and you shouldn't have significant pain from like a transfermal. It should be discomfort, which can be um, usually managed with Tylenol. Significant pain is an alert that um, you, the staff, everyone is quick to jump on to see um, what is going on because there may be an underlying issue. Chest drainages we talked about with the approaches where we see less and less of that because of the uh, transfemoral cases. And ventilator, um, if the patient is intubated, we are getting away from doing our cases under general anesthesia. More of them are under MAC. Um, if they are intubated, we'd like to extubate them in the OR before they go up to the ICU. If they can't because of a particular reason, then as soon as possible they are extubated. And arrhythmias, we are, um, like I mentioned before, constantly aware of um, monitoring that. They're on telemetry until they're cleared by EP. Um, also, neurostatus, neuro checks are done every two hours. Patients, there is a uh, risk of stroke with this procedure, although we've had some patients that had had strokes. Um, so every two hours, checking pulses, vascular access, making sure that the limbs are intact and there's no issue with uh, perfusion. Dysphagia is common in elderly patient if you need a swallow consult. If we identify that pre-op or in our MUC meetings or multidisciplinary weekly meetings, we will get a swallow consult. Um, antiplatelet therapy we talked about and then the transfer, getting these patients. We typically do not want them to go to rehab facilities because of the heavily um, laden salted foods that are there and patients tend to recuperate much better at home with their family. We do talk about that as well to give them a fair warning about knowing what the expectations are to when you are discharged. It is typically to home with your family around for the first week. Our patients are seen then 30 days in our clinic and a year, and then they're, they're, they graduate. For the 30 days, they are followed up by their cardiologist, and hopefully, um, we do have our patients coming in um, after TAV or cardiac rehab phase one occurs. Phase two is usually done um, in our clinic at 30 days. We want to give them our blessing, and then they can go to phase two and phase three after that. The recent initiatives um, that we've tried to um, 
um, start or the minimalist approach. We had a big, um, uh, like a year and a half ago, had our team all together to try to really bring these patients through the process with no Foley's, no cortices, um, doing, getting away from general anesthesia and doing max. Some hospitals do local anesthetic and that's it. Um, we do choose general anesthesia for certain patients if they have paralysis of their um, vocal cords, if they speak a different language. You really don't want to be dealing with someone who is slightly sedated or deep sedation and they're speaking a different language and you're in the OR putting a valve in. So we tend to put those patients under a general anesthesia um, um, sedation. The other thing is that we try to transition out of the OR into the cath lab. We do some of our cases in the cath lab. It is a big undertaking um, for the cath lab because of uh, we only have two rooms. We have to accommodate STEMIs, and uh, there are other physicians and a, a whole slew of procedures that are done there. When we do open our third lab, hopefully we'll have more availability in the cath lab. We did talk about um, early ambulation. It was another new initiative. Our patients, uh, because they want to, um, after the procedure, get up to go to the bathroom, we want to get away from Foley's, um, and just that it's better. People do better with um, moving around their muscles, you're moving them, physical therapy. Um, it's even better. So early ambulation, three hours after the procedure, we tend to move them, sit them up if we can, if their groins are okay. And then physical therapy does come to see the first case, um, usually that afternoon. And then if it's a second and third case, they see them the next day, from what I understand that they've been telling me, we've been trying to work this out logistically, but it's six hours after the procedure um, that they can get up out of bed. Has it been working? It's hard to um, deal with the groin issues sometimes and these patients that have arrhythmia issues and have <coughs> a temporary wiring. So those obviously trump getting these patients out of bed. We are also thinking forward about having the patients, rather than coming through the ASU to holding, get admitted to the cath lab when we do approach that um, time frame, and going to the step-down unit or one of the telemetry floors. These are the reasons for early mobilization, ambulation, post-haver. And again, um, there are some vital sign parameters that were put forth, uh, heart rate greater than 55 and less than 100, systolic blood pressure, and SAT uh, greater than 90% to initiate that if everything is stable from the groin through arrhythmias. This is our initial heart valve team that we started with. Um, Dr. Gallagher obviously did join us. I have to get a picture of him in here somehow and crop him in. Um, this is, these are our guys in the, uh, our whole team in the OR. Very dedicated team that they work very well together. And this is actually one of our patients who had a cath. And um, during the cath, if you can see this, it's a heart. That's the calcification on the valve, a heart on the heart. So I just put that in there. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, anyway, does anyone have any questions? <coughs> every patient gets it. Uh, yeah, every patient will get a, t a TVP in the OR. We take it out all the time unless they have an, uh, any arrhythmia. It stays in and then they're brought up to the ICU. How do you, how do you stop We don't stop it with the, we just pace. The Sapien 3 is paced at about 160 to 180. The core valve is paced about 120 to 140. It's at a lower, because you have time and the, um, when you're deploying the core valve, it's a slower um, deployment. You have more control over it. So we do pace for both of those, just that they have essentially no significant output that the valve could be ejected. Anyone else? Are you having any bleeding problems? During the procedure? Not typical. Yes. Not typically. I mean, we do ACTs in the OR, the activated clotting time. We keep it at a certain level. We give heparin when we um, need to, based on the ACT. If anyone is on Coumadin 
Prodax or Zeralto that's held um, <clears throat> a few days before. Um, if someone's on Plavix and aspirin, we keep them on Plavix and aspirin. If it's a transfemoral approach, really not so much because even in the cath lab, if we do angioplasty, someone's on um, Plavix and aspirin, we just still maintain that. So nothing significant. All patients are type and cross match in case they need a transfusion. So, but with tra if we were to do transaortic, transapical, if the surgeons want to hold Plavix, we will hold it probably about five before. I know with the early ambulation you're talking about the kind of patients yeah, we do, we, we speak about them, um, but you know, it, ever since we started doing that a few months ago, um, a couple patients did have, one had an arrhythmia issue. Yeah, so it really hasn't kind of, we haven't had enough time, but we do identify early amb ambulation. There is a grid that we use for the anesthesiologist and the staff in the OR that this is an early ambulation patient change when you're in the OR. <clears throat> and then it's a full. The orders are supposed to be put in by the physician assistants for early ambulation. Has that been happening? No. Okay, so I'll just take a look, see, as we roll out a few more patients, just to see what's um, going on with that, but it should be taking place through them. Corinne? What's the most common are they different? Um, we do see heart block, that's typical. We sometimes may see AFib, but that's less common, more heart block. Um, we've had patients that have had intraoperatively an arrhythmia, um, and then it's like a bundle branch, left bundle, right bundle branch. The left bundle seems to be more typical. And then, you know, when EP does come in, if they find the right criteria, then they will put the pacemaker in, typically the next day. Anyone else? Thank you.